to start off and talk about Plato's quite extraordinary ideas about beauty right. that influenced Western culture for a long time. Would you be able to talk a little bit about what he thought about beauty was and where it came from? Yes. Um, Plato thought that um, that we are motivated by beauty uh, in um, wherever we discover it. And the primary place that we discover it is in uh, each other. You know, the, the beautiful young man is mm. his ideal. Who, um, and it's connected with of course, with eros, sexual uh, feeling, but Plato believed that's where it begins. But it has to be transcended because uh, um, the sexual feeling, if if uh, if we just follow that path, uh, we lose beauty as well because we don't ever come to grasp the full idea of it. The idea is a kind of intellectual thing, and, and we discover beauty in the, you know, the beautiful youth. But th- through that discovery, we in- we encounter the idea of the beautiful as such, which we then see as a, a feature of the whole of reality, and uh, and that uh, and the pursuit of it should motivate us because in some way we're we're nearer to God through pursuing beauty. Is beauty to see beauty as a kind of a kind of God in himself, or a, the realm in the realm of the gods. In the realm of the gods, yes, it's a transcendental thing. So, so it's sort of lifting us out of this world into a higher sphere of contemplation. You know and that it, it's very. It isn't fully worked out in Plato, but that idea has been an inspiration throughout our civilization, and it comes back in the Middle Ages. You know, the idea of you know that that. Um, that we find beauty, especially in the, uh, you know, in, in our sexual interests. But in once we found it, that lifts us out of this world into a higher way of being. Um, so it's like a when we contemplate its radiance, it's like we're contemplating something from another world in the realm of the exactly, gods. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a visitation from the realm of the gods. Um, did. Kant believed something similar to Plato in that beauty connects us to the ultimate experience. Or Ka- you, you, you've hit on a very difficult question there. Uh, Kant, Kant did believe that the, that beauty is absolutely fundamental to our interests, you know, that we, uh, we really are directed towards it. But he had a completely different view. He, for him, it was a thing in this world uh, about which uh, we make judgments, we make judgments of beauty, we compare things, um, we make choices. And it's all to do with uh, with understanding our place in this world. Uh, and he, he, he made the very interesting suggestion that in the pursuit of beauty, we are, as he put it, suitors for agreement. As I say, we're not just making choices for our own purposes only. Mm. We're, we're choosing things in order to come into agreement with others about them so that we are, as it were, sharing our environment with them. And that was all important for Kant because he believed that, you know, the primary object of beauty is the natural world, the world around us. And that, uh, and that making judgments of beauty, we are integrating ourselves into it, becoming part of things in a way that we wouldn't otherwise perhaps be. Uh, so it, it was for him a very humanising thing. Going back to um, the more kind of almost religious mm. ideas and the Christian idea of beauty, um, some theologians believe it's a glimpse into what the world might have been like if, when Adam and Eve were in the yes. Garden of Eden. Right. And that feeling is we're just getting a glimpse of, and if they didn't fall in the garden, yes. then that's how the world that, is, that uh, idea of beauty. Yeah, that's a, a Christian sort of, version of Plato really saying that uh, that uh, insofar as God's creation goes the, the act of creation uh, this beauty is of the essence yeah but but uh, we we abused that creation uh, and it, with our abuse ugliness enters the world you know and a- alienation and conflict and that's all that is true um I mean, that's a true, true of the Christian view. But. If we're describing 
uh, beauty as something external, if if Plato was, mm. and um, be it through a piece of art or a building or mm. music, and it's a, almost a type of religious experience, experiencing something yeah. from... Is there a place for... Um, if you're not religious, if you don't believe yeah. in that, in kind of appreciating beauty... Yes. Well, of course. You see, um, this is why Kant is so important. Uh, Kant was a figure of the Enlightenment, you know. Uh, he was a sort of religious person, but very, very uh, sceptical. Um, and for him, it, you know, it was quite possible not to believe in God, uh, uh, you know, uh, and not to, not to take a formal religious position but you could never deny beauty he thought and and for many of his contemporaries contemporaries you know someone like byron for instance the mm. pursuit of beauty was a god substitute you know I, the idea is i can't believe in god but at least i can believe in the you know the manifestation of the, uh, of what god would have been you know in in this world and can't believe that beautiful some the beautiful is something that pleases immediately about concepts. I don't that, that's, that's right. Yeah. Do you think that beauty, personally, do you think beauty is an intellectual thing, a physical thing, or a more mystical yeah. thing? These are such difficult questions. <laughs> uh, my, um, it, it it has an intellectual component in the sense that you know the beautiful is something that you contemplate. You don't just look at it and say, "Yeah, that's nice." If it really, if it, if it really captivates you through its beauty, then there, then there's a kind of meaning that rather radiates from it, and you want to understand it. But it's also sensory in the sense that you know it's only by looking at it, or, or in the case of music, listening to it, or with poetry, you know, running the words through your mind. It's only that through the sensory experience that you can appreciate this. But you also have to direct your attention fully onto it and it, the most beautiful things that we know convey a, a great burden of meaning often you know to think just mm. think of a you know um, a, a painting by Leonardo or Rembrandt or something like that mm -hmm. or Symphony of Beethoven's you can't say well like, that's nice as, as though that was all you had to say about it you know it, it touches something deep in us um, I want to go on to a bit more scientific Right. Um, Root now. Um, there are a few theories about beauty that come from um, in evolutionary psychology. Mm. Um, the need that, that talk about the need to make things special. Yeah. That, that, this is dysoniaca. Uh, yeah, mm. and, uh, exactly. Mm. Uh, and in things like uh, festivals and rituals that need yeah. to make things special. Can you talk a little bit? Yeah, that, that, there, this is a theory that she, uh, uh, she's an anthropologist as much as anything else, and she argues quite reasonably that, um, uh, that there is a need, as you say, to make things special in life. In other words, to set aside certain rituals, certain important moments where we come together and celebrate our oneness, you know, um, the old idea of a rite of passage, you know, when, when somebody is born, when they get married, mm. when they die, mm. etc. We, uh, we, we make this into a collective experience which brings us together in a consoling way because there are so many ways otherwise that we're in conflict with each other. We need these special times, uh, which uh, Christmas being an obvious instance of it, yeah. where we sit around uh, and forget our differences uh, and recognise that this is the best that we've got. Uh, and um, she says she thinks that the experience of beauty is like that. It's a special case of this. It's as though you know, to making making something beautiful is a way of making something special. And my own view is that that's okay. It's, it's true that that happens, but that doesn't give us a full theory of what is beautiful. It's not just because mm -hmm. there are so many different ways of making things special, you know. And the way that uh, that Bach made uh, the sounds of the harpsichord special is a very mm -hmm. special kind of special, you know. <laughs> uh, and I think it doesn't say enough, you know. It doesn't touch on the way in which. Uh, the the creation of works of art actually lifts our experience to a higher level. Um, what do you think of 
um, Darwin's suggestion in his uh, book, The Descent of Man, he talks about um, beauty emerging through natural selection yeah. and the creating the painting is... The sexual selection, yeah. Yes. Yeah, all that. Again, that's, a, that's reasonable up to a point, but people have tried to try to understand this and make a full theory out of it, it seemed to me to always end up uh, reducing art to something less important than it actually is. Mm. You know, uh, um, uh, one thought is, you know, that, that it's like the peacock, the peacock's tail, mm. which uh, attracts the peahen, um, uh, uh, even though it's completely dysfunctional from the point of view of the peacock, you know, and this makes him into a great target of predators and all the rest. Um, but and then the thought is that that's why men write poetry and and sing songs, but to attract the the female mm. and, uh, in, in the way that is necessary. But the fact is that women write poetry and sing songs yeah. as well. You know, it, it's mutual and it's it isn't part of that um, courtship procedure that the other animals uh, engage in. It's something higher. It involves our rational capacities as well. That's what I would say. And this. On that, uh, the idea of the sexual desire, and it makes beauty making us focus on the individual rather than just yeah. any any old um, any old person. What, yeah. what do you think the implications are of that? That is one of the most important questions that human beings confront. You know that we, uh, although the sexual impulse is universal, mm. you know it, it it can be directed towards any woman or any man mm -hmm. but the fact is it, it has a natural tendency also to focus on the individual and it's only when it's fully focused on the individual that the full sexual experience mm -hmm. is there for us mm -hmm. that's what falling in love is mm -hmm. and why it has a kind of metaphysical character you know it, uh, it's as though we've we've extracted that beloved thing from the whole mass of mankind mm -hmm. and made her into something completely uh, unique to herself and that is um, an experience which has always been of the greatest value to people and it's very like the experience of art of course you know work of art comes before us in the same way it's purely itself completely saturated mm -hmm. with its own being uh, as the beloved object is in sexual desire Beauty in the, the sacred, mm. sacred uh, places, we've got sacred things, we've got... What do you think the significance of the idea of the sacred is? Um, well, this is something which uh, I think is, again, very extremely important, that, the, 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 uh, that our experience of the beautiful and our experience of the sacred are very close to each other. Uh, and obviously people, all religious people... Um, try to unite them. You know, when when you build a church or or make an altarpiece and so on, that's that's a gift to God always. And, mm. and I think, you know, even an unbelieving artists feel that you know when they're most inspired moments that they are doing something sacred, uh, making a gift to the Almighty. Um, I, and I try and say something about this in my film. I don't know if you've seen the film I yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that these are somehow right next door to each other, these experiences, and they spill over into each other. But I don't know what more you can say about it. Um, I'd like to ask you about the kind of subversive nature of beauty and it not always being a good thing. Yeah. For example, a man being attracted to a woman who might not be... Yes. And he might think, condone her... Vices. Yeah, well, it, absolutely. There is the subversive side because it takes hold of you and can take uh, can pull you out of the uh, field of your natural moral being. You know, and that is absolutely uh, sex, uh, sexual se sexual attraction. Obviously, does that, uh, and the beauty of the of its object, uh, and also works of art can. You know, there are. Um, works of art that have a kind of corrupting effect mm. um, and which play with the corrupting effect. And there are some of the highest merit which play with the corrupting effect by way of using that to transcend it, like Baudelaire's Fleur du Mal. It takes you into the most sordid um, 
feelings of the ordinary city dweller uh, and you feel the beauty of those feelings but it also is holding you back mm. uh, and using them mm. like a, uh, to propel you upwards and that's an extraordinary thing and again it's very hard to explain I think you explained it very well um, in Exploring Beauty we're really exploring the kind of s- the sentiments of other people rather than mm. anything deeper in in the world would you agree with that well that is again big question is beauty out there in the world or is it in there in us and, yes and uh, I, I think that there is a there is a dichotomy here that we don't have to accept we can say that there is something in between those two mm-hmm. you know uh, it, which is that of a consensus if we all feel the same about something uh, it, that is a truth about our feelings, but it's also putting those feelings into the world, you know, uh, uh, like our moral feelings. We all feel the same about rape and murder, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and that's another way of putting that, to say that they really are wrong, you know. Uh, yeah. And similarly, in in the love of beautiful things, we're always working towards some kind of consensus. We're never content to be just on our own. And in that sense, it's kind of objective too. If we, um, I'm going to quote you here, and <laughs> okay, carry if, on. If we aim in every case for supreme beauty, we would end up with aesthetic overload. Mm. The clamorous masterpieces, rejoicing for attention side by side, would lose their distinctiveness, and beauty of each of them will be at war with the beauty of the rest. Yes. So, do you think that? We could have too much beauty. Yeah, I sort of feel this, that this is one of the reasons why we need art galleries, to, to confine it, you know, <laughs> knock it away. Uh, uh, the, the, there is a, I, I would say there's a great distinction between the sort of high art and everyday craft and everyday the everyday managing of aesthetic effects and i know this room is terribly untidy and all that but nevertheless i do make an effort to 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 have the sort of furniture i like and to put things uh, arrange things in such a way that i can be at ease with them and i hope that others would be at ease as well and that that everyday pursuit of beauty is a much more it's more humdrum, but actually more necessary thing for us than these great works of high art. You can imagine civilizations that never have great paintings in the of the Leonardo Rembrandt kind, mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, and never have great works of music or poetry. But you can't imagine a civilization that doesn't have the everyday arranging of things so that they're pleasing. You know, so that you can, the family can sit down at, around the table and feel that they're looking at something harmonious. You know, I think that's and that is very important to make that distinction. Can't believe that people who um, take an interest in beauty have a moral kind of uh, disposition to, um, to to goodwill. Do yes. you think that? I don't, yeah. Do you think that people who appreciate beauty are more inclined to have better moral values well that's uh, I wish I I wish it were true uh, <laughs> but you know we have all the terrible counter examples the concentration camp guard who goes home in the evening to listen to to, to a string quartet played by the people who are next day going to be gassed you know mm-hmm. that, um, we know that there are some deep paradoxes here but but while we're appreciating something beautiful we are always overwhelmed by a sense that this is making life worthwhile mm. and, and that, that goodness is there in the heart of it somewhere. But it's um, what to do about these paradoxical cases, I don't know. Um, early Christian and Islamic theologians, some of them claimed that beautiful things had the power to improve us morally yeah. and spiritually. You and just you uh, don't I think, think that's. You don't I think do it's think it is true. You think it is true. Yeah, but I, but I also recognise that it, it so often doesn't work. You know, and people can take the pleasure of the beautiful thing without the moral lesson. Um, I want to ask you a question um, about why people want to to own beautiful objects and have yeah. beautiful things. Is it because we want to have these? qualities close to us or do we want to try and 
embody the qualities mm. that this beautiful thing has almost internally or is it an appreciation of it from yeah well it's a very interesting point this because only some beautiful things can be owned you can't own a symphony mm. you know you can't put it in your pocket and walk out of the uh, concert hall with it but you can own a painting and there are some good reasons for owning a painting namely because you find it beautiful mm -hmm. there's some bad reasons you know we can, namely because it's a, a, an investment you know you're going to be able to sell it for more later uh, and because paintings are objects that can be owned uh, this complicates the things i think as to why people want to have them yeah um you know we are acquisitive beings too and if you go into a house which is just full of precious works of art accumulated because they're precious, you tend to be a bit suspicious of the person who, who owns them, don't you? Mm. You tend to think, oh, he's, he's got the wrong scale of values here. Mm. It's the ownership that matters rather than the thing. I'm going to uh, quote you here about um, ornaments. We mm. talked about, we touched on it just now, but on objects, mm. but the idea that ornaments liberate us from the tyranny of the useful and satisfy our need for harmony they make us feel at home mm. they remind us that we have more than just practical needs we don't just eat sleep and sleep we have spiritual and moral needs too mm. and if these those needs go unsatisfied then so do we so you know, yeah i agree with me there <laughs> and you know that's why we decorate yeah. christmas trees yeah, etc et yeah is there anything more? Uh, there important? is something important to say here, actually, mm -hmm. uh, that, which is that we have a need for the useless. Uh, if our whole life is spent on being useful and doing practical things, doing things which are, have a purpose, um, we then have the great question, why? But when we, with ornaments and little things laying, lying around, that you can take joy in the fact that they're there they're just there because they're there here is something that doesn't have to have a purpose and then and then you think you feel in re relation to it maybe that's true of me too i don't have to have a purpose all the time mm -hmm. i can just sit and be and that is consoling do you think that everyday beauty is more important than our lives than the, the great works of beauty well the, yeah we've touched on this touched and on this. I think this is important when it comes to architecture mm -hmm. because you know there are these great architects like you know uh, like Borromini or uh, uh, someone uh, um, that produce works that people uh, stand back from and are amazed by and think that's fantastic mm -hmm. but most architecture can't be like that it's it's there because it has to be there you know mm -hmm. you, you need these houses we need this street etc mm -hmm. um, and therefore everyday beauty takes on a huge importance when it comes to building oh, we touched on this as well but i just want to talk about the architecture of everyday and fashion and how right well, where does fashion fit in? Yeah. Uh, yes. In, we know that fashions change, but we also know that they, they, they change in a very special way. There's a gravitational force in fashion. People are pulled into it. Mm. Uh, um, and it could be, you know, some fashions are extraordinary and weird. But nevertheless, they only become fashions because some because other people are attracted into them. It's a collective thing. You can't have a fashion of being just yourself. Um, and, and in dress, this is incredibly important. It's a kind of crowd emotion, isn't it? The, uh, the, the, and and the, when the fashion shows occur in the spring and in the, uh, in the autumn, mm. um, this is a kind of collective excitement. Um, so fashion is a very very important thing in everyday aesthetics and of course in high art too it's not it's, we won't call it fashion but we think of a kind of evolution uh, that that styles have become uh, they come to fruition and then we move on that another style comes in uh, but each style makes room for expressing a, a wide range of things within the confines of that style I want to go on to beauty and taste. Right. Um, if a standard of um, beauty exists, um, it doesn't not lie in the qualities of the object, but in the sentiments of the judge, Hume suggests. Mm. Yeah, um, Hume, Hume does, yeah. Um, essentially argues that judgment is a, 
of taste reflects the character of the one who makes it. Yeah. Can you talk about the implications of this? Yes, I think uh, Hume's view is that that in matters of taste, discrimination is all important. We're trying to, uh, and the critic is someone who's trying to say, look, it's worth looking at this one, not that one. Mm-hmm. You know, you're wasting your time with that, but you're not wasting your time with this. And uh, and refinement of of, uh, of taste and uh, the ability to incorporate this um, judgment into a wider perspective on life, all that is important feature of the critic, and it makes it makes us trust one critic rather than another. Uh, uh, so he is trying to bring the judgment of taste back into the state of mind of the critic, but at the same time said it's not just arbitrary, uh, because it really matters what kind of person that critic is. And through this, does he he tries to get the discussion away from beauty and more towards qualities? Y- yes, qualities of the observer. Oh, qualities of the observer, such yeah. as... Um, the qualities that we might admire being yeah. good and yeah, uh, and, 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 and yeah, and, re- uh, and refined and controlled, etc. Do you think that uh, people are entitled to private tastes in the public realm? For example, if your neighbour has kind of kitsch mermaids, oh, or gosh. this is yeah, it's, this is a this is a big question that obviously uh, confronts planners everywhere you know there, there was that case i think i might have mentioned it in something i wrote of a, a guy an american hippie moved into a house in an Ox, in oxford in a street of quite elegant houses you know where the planners have strict control of what happens he puts a, a a shark diving into the roof you know, uh, sort of, um, erected with all kinds of steel girders and things, uh, because he thinks that's fun, uh, and that was a real contest with the planners, who, and the neighbours all complained. Of course, they said, "Look, this is completely ruining our street." Yeah, he won the case uh, that he could keep that, because uh, arguing, you know, that this is a work of art and an expre- of, a, of great expressive value, but when he won his case. He, he sold the house and went back to America. So, uh, <laughs> so but the, my sympathies were with the neighbours, I have to say. You know, you, you can't just do anything anywhere. That taste has something to do with good manners. You know, we don't walk into a room of well-dressed people who are, you know, in some important functional event and, and, and then take our clothes off and <laughs> throw our arms around and, and shriek, you know. Um this kind of brings me on to beauty and kitsch. And right. in your book on beauty, you talk about um, the the article that haven't got the avant garde and kitsch published. Oh yeah, by uh, by oh, oh Krem Greenberg. Yeah, yeah. nineteen thirty nine was it or something like that. And I, where he argued that figurative painting was dead and that you yeah. can't do anything more with it, and anything else was just copy or yeah. just faking pastiche, yeah. pastiche yeah. of what had been already been done yeah. before. And he was saying that we should be pushing forward yes. doing modern art. Exactly. Um, Abstraction is the way forward, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the implications of the kind of kitschification yes. in things like art and religion? Yeah. And if this is a good or a bad thing? You, you, I mean, you've hit on one of the big questions of our time. Yeah. Um, we do think, I mean, most people who are at all sensitive to art, we do think there's such a thing as kitsch. And we do think that it should be avoided. You can't be a great artist who's just producing kitsch. Although Jeff Koons pretends to be a great artist who's producing kitsch. Um, but, you know, there are problems. with. Do you, do you think his work is, is beautiful? No, no, I think it's appalling. Uh, but, I mean, I certainly think it's kitsch, but I, I think it's a very special kind of kitsch. It's kitsch in inverted commas, which says, you know, this is such kitsch that it can't possibly be kitsch. That's the idea, but, but does that go back to taste? When you say that it's it's awful, is it because you don't like the shiny? It's t- yes. Yeah, so how to explain why it's awful is is a big problem. But in my view, it's taking the most the lowest kind of emotions uh, 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 and and varnishing them and saying it's really okay to be like this. You know, uh, it's um, it's not exploring the human condition at all. 
but uh, but the problem of kitsch is a real one. Many people think, uh, like Clem Greenberg, saying you can't even do any kind of figurative painting, it'll just end up as kitsch. The fact yeah. is that people thought that for a long while, and the kind of things he recommended in the place of it, like, like de Kooning and so on, have never <laughs> appealed to the popular taste either. But, uh, and it led him to dismiss Edward Hopper and, uh, mm. and those sort of, um, and Wyeth and so on. Uh, and most people now looking back on that say that's, that was absurd. Hopper had something to say about, about life in the American city and yeah. he made it beautiful uh, uh, and, and questioned it too. Uh, and I think figurative painting therefore has come back a little bit since then and people try very hard to be figurative without being kitsch and that's what Hockney of course um, has tried so quite successfully to do. Beauty and art. Um, Can art be meaningful without being beautiful? Yes I think of course uh, um, beauty is a supreme value but it's only one aesthetic value. Um, you know, tragedies, for instance, the, some, a genuinely tragic work of art. We're more interested in that quality than mm. in in the quality of beauty and like and the genuinely comic. You know, if you um, something like a Dickens novel where you're right at laughing all the way through, mm. you know, you, you don't think, well, hey, that was beautiful. You'd say that was really funny. Um, but there are works of art where you appreciate them almost for their ugliness, um, though it's a special kind of ugliness. But uh, you know, Goya's frightening uh, picture of the execution of the uh, uh, rebels in when, whenever it was. You remember the? the um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I can't remember the. I don't remember the name of the. Yeah, yeah. Name. But um, you look at that and you're horrified because it's so true to the to the thing, the, the fear and despair on the faces of the victims you couldn't you wouldn't say that's beautiful it, it, it's a portrait of a horrible ugly episode and it's not ugly either but nevertheless the ugliness of what's happening feeds into the aesthetic value of it and you wouldn't want it otherwise why do you think painting songs buildings are so important in relation to beauty do they give us something that maybe nothing else can yeah um, I think that's fair. Um, a life without beauty, without any experience of beauty, we would tend to think is it's not really worth living. You know, of course, love is important and uh, and worship of, uh, of the Lord, you know, and all the other things. But um, nevertheless, if there was no beauty in it at all, it would be lacking something huge. Um, uh, and uh, beauty comes to us in certain forms as you say painting and uh, and, and music and, and and architecture as well as from nature and I think there are many people who don't appreciate art at all uh, of any kind you know they've got yeah. they're unmusical they're, 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 they don't know what, why people pe- paint things buildings are just objects for them etc um, and you would want to say, well, they really are missing something. But Kant would say, and this is one of his great insights, is that they are, they wouldn't, they don't, they they can't exist without the experience of beauty itself. It's just that they don't get it from works of art. They must get it from nature. You know, they must surely see the difference between a beautiful bird and, and a, a, you know, and a, a, a merely clumsy one, mm. <coughs> and so on. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between objectifying an object and appreciating an object for its yeah. beauty and how this relates to art, perhaps? Yeah, well, objectifying, this is a kind of technical word. We sometimes use sometimes use it when you say that someone is objectifying another person, yes. turning that person into a mere thing, yes. not uh, an obviously... You know, um, some kinds of sexual crime are like that. Mm. A, a rape is an objectification, turning a, a, the victim into a, a mere object, mm. uh, and that's all true. Um, and of course, when we see an object as beautiful, we are not objectifying it in that sense at all. We are subjectifying it. 
we're filling it with our own life. You know, we're making it look back at us from our own eyes, so to speak. You know, and that's what we do with the painting. Um, I want to move on to beauty and architecture now. Right. Um, let's go to uh, Louis Sullivan's argument that beauty arises when mm. form follows function. Yeah. And that we experience beauty when we see the function in action. Yes. Do you think that beauty should be treated separately from um, kind of utility in architecture? <clears throat> it's a really interesting question. Uh, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, th that pu purely functionalist things in architecture are always questionable. We want we want them to be justified in some other way. Mm -hmm. You know, in an architecture where there's just hundreds of functionalist details uh, can get people get you asking questions. You know, what the hell is this all about? Mm -hmm. uh, but we have these examples like Guardi's uh, Guardi's um, stuff in Barcelona, you know, yeah. uh, which is <laughs> pure functionalist um, nonsense going on forever, and and people are amazed and moved by it but I think in ordinary architecture Sullivan has got it the wrong way round form and function are connected but it's not that form follows function it's that function follows form mm. if you if you make something beautiful like this place where we are here mm. people will find new uses for it and, and look at you know I take the example of, of Manhattan you know the old Manhattan in lower Manhattan I don't know if you know it in, yeah, in yeah. New York. Yeah. You know, yeah. th those buildings, people, they love them. They want to keep them. So the function keeps on changing. Um, you know, uh, and uh, 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 so it's the, because of the form that, the, that they fulfill one function after another. And so you think there's a, a, an argument for, in terms of, in relation to sustainability, um, in creating beautiful buildings yeah, because you don't have to keep turning them down and building new I ones. think that's absolutely right uh, and I, I think of a lot of thing, buildings that are built today as ecological catastrophes because they, you could never change the function with a, 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 and keep the form to so think of the the, the walkie talkie that hideous thing in in london yeah. you know what's going to happen to it in the long run it's not going to last more than 20 years but the the ecological cost of demolishing it and disposing of the of the, of the debris it, uh, you know it, it will be a formidable um can you talk a little bit about the the pattern books that people used to use to design. Mm. I mean, there was consensus in, in what was beautiful in architecture for a very long time in the West, in the classical tradition, right. where originality, this is kind of a two questions in one, originality wasn't really necessary. And the romantic <coughs> movement, um, well, you could argue it was a romantic movement, helped start this idea that greatness and originality should be rewarded. Yes. Um, before this, there was... Uh, and, and it's kind of created the put emphasis on the individual genius yes. uh, well that is again a huge question but <clears throat> the, the, the romantic emphasis on genius is of course very important in the history of aesthetics uh, we all know that but um, the role of genius in architecture is a very um, complex thing you know, there, there were these geniuses like Michelangelo and and so on, who uh, for, who envisaged forms and uh, uh, and compositions that nobody had thought of before, uh, and worked things out in a most striking way, and made very expressive things. Um, but we don't normally want an ordinary builder to be like that. You know. Um, it would be like the, the the man with the shark in the roof of his house, sort of thing. Uh, we do we do need order, discipline, repeatable things. You know, a street, a, a, a pleasant street, is almost always made of repetitions. But of course, de de designing the things that are repeated that takes genius, or could take genius. You know, mm. Palladio did that. 
all, all Palladio's little formats are for details that nobody had thought of before, like the Venetian window. Well, mm. Sassario invented that, but still, you know, this is something that can be repeated for, uh, down a street and really look good. And the person who does that, working from a pattern book, it does has no claim to be a genius. He's just doing the, the thing that he ought to do. Um, so rec- reconciling these two things, you know, the, the need for the creative um, gesture that, that creates the, the meaningful parts of a building and the ability to use those parts in a whole composition, a street or a town or something, uh, I think that's one of the great um, questions that architects have to, to confront. Because was John Ruskin, who was, who argued that, you know, there's too much, there's too much going on, and there's too many different styles, there's too yeah. many, and it's we should be, it should be more harmony. Yes, I mean harmony is something that we always want, but but buildings can harmonise if they're in, even if they're in different styles, but, but they have to have some respect for each other. Mm. You know, the thing that Colin Wilson. St. John Wilson, you know, the British Library up next to St. Pancras Station. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people feel that that's great. That actually does fit in, even though it's a totally modern idiom, mm. uh, because he's sort of looks at the buildings are looking with respect at each other. You know, We've got uh, the brickwork and the uh, and the that sort of quasi Gothic way of putting little towers here and mm. uh, and, and built out buildings there, etc. Um, engin- it could be argued that engineers changed architecture from being decorative to being more functional, or they yeah. helped in that process. Suddenly, a column wasn't that wasn't doing anything that was yeah. more really decorative was kind of pointed at and saying that's fake and yes. it needs to be doing something. Do you well, any- yeah, that is something that again, that's a bit like Louis Sullivan's form follows function yes. thing. That yeah. it, it is true that. Um, you know that Ruskin also was of this view. You know, he thought that that faking things was a kind of sin. Mm-hmm. You know, and the column that that pretended to be a column when it was actually just a drain pipe that was something. <laughs> you know, that was something that really uh, was an offence of the uh, to the gods. Um, I think you can get oh, you can get over puritanical about this, but you know things like Art Nouveau architecture in Belgium and the turn of the 19th to 20th century, that's full of faked things. You know, um, you know, ceilings which aren't actually held up by the things that seem to hold them up and all, mm. all the rest, because it's part of a decorative exuberance. Um, but, again, the, the Gothic Revival people, like Pugin in particular, mm. uh, and, and Ruskin, they were right that there's something beautiful about the way in which the Gothic, all, all the details in a great Gothic church are also functionally necessary. You know, the buttresses and the, uh, and the, all, all the vaulting and, and, and so on. Uh, 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 that if it were just a fake, if it were just painted on or something, mm. you know, that, that uh, you would feel that somehow it hadn't made its point. It, the, the part of the point of the Gothic Church is to raise a monument to God, and you do this by showing you can do it. You know, mm. with the, uh, with these things that might otherwise fall down. I'm going to touch on on different styles, mm. um, balance, order, and complexity, elegance, coherence. These are all elements that we know that could help make things beautiful and mm. and harmonious. But none of these are tied down to any particular uh, style. And do you think style in architecture is important? Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, um, it's, it's, e- even the absence of a style is a style, so to speak, you know. Um, uh, and it's one of the things that upsets people, a, a styleless building, you know, just, just a, a box. You know, all over London you find these box lands you know just a, a plain shoe box which has one one week it has asda on it next week uh, it, it it might might be boots you know whatever mm. but um yeah that, that, that uh, it, 
the, the, those sort of developments have uh, a part of what upsets people about the way our city is is going. You know, the, the, some effort should be made for to fit things into the environment, and style is one way that we do that. I want to talk about uh, pastiche architecture, mm. and there are there are towns in China that have, have kind of copies of European cities. That's right. Yeah, and there's also uh, places you've got copies of the of Tower Bridge, and you've got copies of the Eiffel Tower, yeah. and you've got places in in Japan which are copies of yeah. pre twentieth century uh, places um, in Holland, in places Amsterdam. in Holland. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and this is what do you think of? Uh, pastiche architecture and placemaking. Johnny, this is one of the crucial questions that people have because of the all the Poundsbury stuff. You know, yes. I suppose you're going to go on to ask about that. Yes, um, it's copying is one thing, and pastiche is another. You know, uh, pastiche is sort of a imitating something without actually copying it, but trying to create the same effect. So what uh, it, to take sorry to to take this question back to to beauty mm. if one of these historic towns in in Holland and let's say there's one there's the replica in in China is actually yeah. it's very beautiful as okay, well, well and they're that's both the question. beautiful is it the same type of beautiful? yeah no that's a really good question um it's not very bit different from the question of reproducing a painting. You know, is my mm. reproduction Leonardo on the wall really beautiful in the way that the one in the Louvre is? Um, well, I think we're inclined to say no, because, uh, you know, one of them uh, is the expression of a different spirit and a different way of life than the other. And it's, you know, we love Paris partly because... There, there radiates from the whole city mm -hmm. the the history of that form of life that has grown there, uh, and that isn't the case of the imitation Paris. Supposing there is one in China, which will probably, which is just a a stage set behind which completely different things are going on. But on the other hand, um, the Chinese feel a need for these um, reproduction cities because the styles that otherwise available to them are so alienating you know mm. and people are, people can't live in, in shanghai as it's as it is today uh, with uh, it's sort of you know it's frightening so that, you know so there's a big movement there to try and mm. try and imitate what europe has i would say that if you can't do something new that really gives people a sense of being at home then the second best is to do a pastiche of what once was someone's home. But it's best if you can do something else, if you can. And that's one of the, one of the tasks facing modern architects today, is how to, how to carry on this great exercise of home building, which is what, what uh, ordinary architecture is, without just reproducing the same thing again and again, making it, fitting it in some way to the new forms of life that have emerged. Um, and so basically, if you can't do something good or better, then you might as well copy what's been done before well, because at least you're, you're not, doing less damage. Exactly. You're not alienating people, at least, because uh, people have already indicated, well, we like that, you know, but but it's not satisfactory. And I have to confess that. And, and this is the question raised by Poundbury. Yes, because I, I, I went to visit Poundbury. Right. And I... And there were moments in there I thought, wow, that's a really nice little little street, yes. and then that's really nice. And oh, this, a lot of it is very pleasant, I thought. Yeah. But then I would notice little details that I could see were completely fake, and yes. and I kind of and I knew as well that behind the traditional facades was a still work frame and or yeah. block work, and and it, that kind of thing made me think, you know, is there a this is the problem that Ruskin was pointing to, you know, mm. the, the, the problem that, that, that buildings shouldn't tell lies. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of a stage set. It's almost yeah, like a film it's, set. It is, but, but the thought is, I mean, just on my, my view about mm. Pembroke, I have the same experience, feeling as you, mm. but my thought is that nevertheless, this is a place where people actually want to live. 
mm. and um, and also it creates employment. It's, it's, it's designed in such a way that, that that there's mixed use right in the heart of the town. Um, so it, people have it in their power to change it and to make it real. You know, it looks a bit fake here and there now, perhaps, mm. but someone might. Uh, Adapt the house that he's got in a bit of a way, or make little little nooks and crannies. You know, I think what uh, nooks and crannies are terribly important. One of the problems with modernist uh, housing estates is that they they don't have nooks and crannies. There's no there's no place that is going to be changed to make some little you know a little corner cafe behind which somebody puts a shed, which then gets turned into mm. into a nightclub, etc. You know, um, and I think uh, at least depending on the I don't know who you know obviously Poundbury is a very controlled environment mm. but um if you start off something in such a way that people feel at home there at least then give them the power to uh, to adapt it and adjust it you probably will end up with those charming nooks and crannies which make it into a real place well, what do you say to the argument that the style of the buildings that are there is not really the thing that makes the successful things you talk about successful hmm. the street it's and the scale and the nooks and crannies you could do that with almost any style yeah of you could use other styles the mix of use, the mix the mix yeah. use the live work yeah absolutely i think that that's one of the lessons that people could take from poundbury is that you could take away that a lot of the neoclassical style of things mm. but I still have a lot of the virtues of the place there still be a sense of place mm. but you have to be careful um, as to what because you know, not all styles create a sense of place you know that is um, and that's where you've really got to think things through okay um, I want to talk about the building better building beautiful commission right. yeah yeah um, what are the what are the aims of the of the commission? The the aim is to overcome popular resistance to new development by providing a, a conception of the planning process that will put beauty in the heart of it. You know, people object to new developments largely on aesthetic grounds. You know, it's mm. spoiling the the place where mm. it is, doesn't fit in, etc. All those things, which I think are perfectly legitimate complaints. So how to how to overcome that? Uh, and you can overcome it if you can adapt the planning process to put beauty at the top of the agenda instead of where it is at the moment. You know, somewhere as a, an afterthought. Um, but that's. How to do that is, you know, I've got to discuss this with all the interested parties and see to what extent they are amenable to this and what kind of conception of beauty they would accept. Um, so, yeah, that was going to be my next question. How, do you, how, would you, how would you do that? And I guess you're saying that you would go out and, and talk to different... Well, I think I've got to talk, we've got to talk to the vested interests, obviously, the architects and the developers and the planners, etc., but more important is to talk to the people and to get opinion polls, see exactly mm. what people want. Uh, you know, people can make mistakes. They can get, they can w want the wrong thing and all that and 20 years time realise, God, that was ridiculous. Mm. But uh, on the whole, in a democracy, you can't ignore what the people think. Uh, uh, and my, my position is that I, as a philosopher, have a, have a conception of beauty and why it's important. And I've tried to put this across, especially in that film that I did for the BBC, which mm. was not about architecture particularly, well, that architecture came in. It was about why beauty matters to ordinary people in everything. Mm. Uh, we are beauty-oriented creatures, uh, and that has not been taken into account sufficiently in our planning system, and certainly not by the architectural profession, in my view, and we we need to think the thing through again uh, and bring the ordinary people into the into the dialogue. Um, what do you say to people who argue that um, kind of housing and the housing crisis is not to do with aesthetics or or style? It's to do with land and wealth and yeah. exploitation and. Oh, and, all that, and yeah. the commission is almost a distraction from these issues that we need to solve first. I, I think that's 
It is to do with, of course, with the need to build the housing crisis. Mm. We haven't got enough homes for people, that's all true. Uh, but you can't separate it from the aesthetic thing because the reason why, uh, we, one reason why not enough is built in this country is popular resistance to it. And this resistance is, doesn't come from wealthy people only. Uh, it comes from uh, even from homeless people. It's young people who are more disposed to object to, you know, uh, high-rise developments uh, in historic places than than older people are, uh, and um, and that's a, there's a real question therefore how to how to overcome this popular resistance. There is, of course, there are other problems: land values. Mm. being the principal one yeah. Yeah. land is overvalued yes. in this country partly because the planning process uh, is so skewed towards amp uh, to, towards giving value to land you know if you get planning permission on a field it increases value by up to 10,000% you know uh, so that it means that the biggest investment in any new building is in the land itself so that all the other things, the quality and style of the house, yeah. seems irrelevant. Uh, and we have to try, you know, I'm not here to solve <laughs> the entire <laughs> problems of the country, but, you know, we can't, we can't obviously isolate the aesthetic question from those sort of questions too. So we'll have to be considering them. But, uh, you know, if I could give an answer to all of them, I, I, I would, but all I've been asked to do is to settle the question how we can put beauty into the heart of the planning process, and which I, which can't be doing any harm. You know. no. um, there is a. Um, you seem to you come across as having um, an emphasis on style in architecture mm. and different styles to favour different styles over other styles. Mm. And so we've got, there's so many different styles out there, classical, gothic, Islamic, Egyptian. Yeah, all that. It, it could be anything. Do you think that we should be pushing any particular style well, the, uh, or presenting a particular mm. style to the public and promoting it as something to pursue in terms of aesthetics and beauty? Yeah. My personal taste is one thing, but that's not what the commission will be about. That mm. will be about finding consensus. Mm. And the easiest way to find consensus is to leave the question of style as open as we can. But I personally do think, not that there is a, a preferred style, mm. but that, that we have been given wonderful examples from which we should learn. And, and I think of the classical pattern book vernacular as such an example. Yes. It's showing us how we can compose things so that uh, they are agreeable to look at. Uh, how, how you can p compose facades, how you can make streets, how you can harmonise scales, etc. Uh, it's one way, but I think you know, people tend to think that a style is, you can just invent it just like that, and that's nonsense. The classical style um, emerged with, through 2,000 years of intense thinking from the Acropolis down to, you know, down to uh, Paddington Station or whatever. Uh, and I think, um, so one, one should try and learn from those examples. And, uh, but it, of course it wouldn't be for me as a mere chairman of a commission to dictate the outcome. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think that my vision is just one among many, it is the vision of a highly educated person who's really trying to understand things. So, so I, shouldn't, I shouldn't betray it, you know, I shouldn't say that's just me, but I don't want to impose it at all. And, and one, one of the point of having the Board of Advisors is that it represents all kinds of styles of people, you know, the people who will, will be consulting. So, do you have a, a message to, to architects and architect students out there working now as to mm. what you think they should be focusing on in terms of beauty in architecture? Yeah, absolutely. My message is go out and look at the things that you find beautiful and draw them. You know, learn how to see them. And Ruskin said you'd never, you, you, you'd never seen anything until you tried to draw it. Um, 
that's a bit exaggerated, but I think, mm. you know, that's what I would say. Uh, and because uh, it's all about educating the eye. Uh, and um, I, I'm always ho hopeful that people, you know, that's how you learn about architecture is by looking at it, not by just sitting on a computer and inventing e envelopes. Okay, maybe that's where we should end then. Yeah. <laughs>